I muted I, you, Mark. I, you muted me? Like, for I real? <laughs> wow. You know what? This speaks volumes <laughs> right here. <laughs> Thou shalt not try me. Mood 24 7. Okay. No, wait, we got to say it. Mood chapter 24, verse 7. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 24 and 7. <laughs> yeah, 24 and 7. Thou shalt not try me. <laughs> and you tried it. How are you? You know, I'm good. Just getting down to my uh, ancestral roots down here and uh, coming to you live from Louisiana. Actually, am I in Louisiana? Hey. Yeah, I am. I'm looking at the Mississippi you River. Crossed right the, you crossed the you crossed the bridge, right? Yeah, we kept going back and you, forth. So half the time, I didn't you, know where where we were. You in Louisiana, girl? <laughs> I'm in Louisiana, and it is country. I'm in the country, though. Like not the city part. I'm in the country. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. But it's well, been great. Uh, well, we got a lot to get into, though. So yeah, uh, I'm ready because. We're going to just be firing ready. off on all cylinders, like pew, pew, pew. I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. Well, uh, let's, oh. <laughs> I'm laughing at Uncle Charles. He says she got that Louisiana happy look. Oh. <laughs> well, must be in the food. Must be in the food. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, hey, do you want to take it? Do you want us to do you want to set us up today? Cue that intro. Right. What's good, everybody? I am Mark Monroe, accompanied by my wonderful co-host, co-producer, co-creator, and all things galactic coming through from the Lou. Give it up for none other than the wonderful. What does it, cousins? This is your Lynn GC and the place to be. How y'all doing on this fine Tuesday? Feeling good, feeling great. And on top of that, ready to talk about some leadership and can you spot winners in the sea well what could possibly be in the midst of a sea of losers at times but how do you spot the like the the whales uh, okay <laughs> we about that life today <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> right how do you spot the whales or the, the 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 sharks that are becoming whales how do you spot them like you know of course we always look at the business models and everything else which i mean that's totally fine but, you know, most of the companies that sit within the S&P 500 today are not covered by their founders. So many of the founders who once upon a time led those companies have probably stepped down, maybe even serve on, you know, what we're going to talk about in a, in a second, the leadership, um, but more so in an advisory capacity um, and then move on to different pastures and everything else. So how do you spot that leadership? Like, for example, you know, looking at, you know, a company that you can take a bite out of, aka Apple, how do you spot its leadership and how can you determine whether or not they're primed and prepped for leadership? So we're going to go through that today. And of course, we got some companies that, you know, can definitely help really like set the tone for that. So without further ado, we're going to get into it. But before we do that, go ahead and hit subscribe if you haven't subscribed down below. And on top of that, if you want to be in the know, just like who was the first cousin in the chat? We don't know. It was King Rail. King Rail. Hey, King Rail. <laughs> you know, it's always cool when I just see like the first, like what is it that people write when they're first in the chat? They're just like, mm -hmm. what's good? Or fam, family, cousins. All right, so shout outs to you, King Rel, for being first in the chat. You had your notification bell turned on. So if you want us to shout you out, go ahead and be first in the chat when we post the video. We tend to post it like anywhere from about an hour to 30 minutes before the show goes live. So there you go. There's a spoiler alert. Deal with it. I put it out there in the ether. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> I 
<laughs> All right. So we got a lot to get into because we're going to go through and we're going to examine some of those things. And what you can do this evening is you can follow along with us. Like, so that's the purpose of tonight's episode where you can follow along and see exactly how is it that we kind of like dissect and go through. And let's get into it. Shall we get into our first guy? Well, wait, wait, wait. Before we do that, I want to send a special shout out to our one of our producers. Yes. Series. Give a big, well, shout out in the chat, you know, emojis, confetti, whatever it is that you want to do. But we're wishing our producer, Victor Robinson, a happy 25th birthday. Like he's wow. been rocking with us for quite some time. He's the magic sauce behind a lot of the shows here at the Come Up series where like things are timed well. Like, for example, just just can I just do it for a quick second? You know, just like, for yeah. example, if I just said, go ahead and cue that outro, then you would see something like this. And so we definitely want to give a huge shout out to you, Vic. You know, we appreciate yes. you and all the work that you do and the energy that you bring. You're always a vibe. So happy 25th birthday, bro. All right. So Jolyn, Jolyn, we are yes. about to get into it. I know that we you got are. a lot of life that's happening out there where you are. So let's look at. Wait, you know, so, go ahead. let me put the disclaimer out there. So I am like in a very public place right now. And okay. so I will be cutting in and out like my mic um, because it's going to get rowdy. Um, my cousins are upstairs, um, so they probably will come downstairs and try to distract me. Um, so it's going to be loud. So I'll be muting in and out. So if I start talking and I'm on mute, it's because I forgot to unmute myself. So I'm just letting you know. So let me know, Mark, if that happens. Got you. We got you. Well, we also got the the magic behind the behind the veil. Yes. Uh, who will also possibly look <laughs> out for you. Yes. Uh, but let's get it started. So in the since it's his birthday, one of the companies that he definitely wanted to put up uh, on the screen is Fortinet. So Vic is a huge fan of Fortinet, uh, also known to many of you cousins, FTNT, uh, which we unveiled a while back, Cloud Solutions Platform. And of course, you we understand the stuff that they bring in, like network security, enterprise networking, all this other stuff, yada, 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 under their products. And of course, they have their solutions. And of course, they have a wide array of partners. But all those things are great and all. But this is where we start to look at it in the sense of the leadership. Like, this is where leadership starts to speak. So, for example... You know, founder, chairman, and board, uh, chairman of the board, and chief executive officer, which is very rare, but you know, and you'll see it in a few companies that we provide here for you today. But Kenzie is actually the founder of uh, Fortinet, and then of course he has his brother Michael Z, who is the CTO. And then of course, as you keep going down from there, you you see that their their board is actually pretty light, <laughs> just as a heads up in comparison to some of the other boards that we're going to show you. But um, let's let's quickly give a quick look as it pertains to Kinji. And I'm, my goal here is I'm doing this all like fresh, so that way I can kind of like give you an idea of what my what my take is as soon as I'm looking at it from the point. So I don't know if things have changed, if board members have been added or they have left. So we're going to find out all of this together. So this data has been provided by Refinitiv. Uh, so here we go. All right. So. He says that he served as chief executive officer, of course, since the dawning of, you know, Fortinet, which was founded in 2000, which is pretty interesting because they're 23 years old now uh, or almost 23, which will be in, I think, uh, November or October. And then he previously served uh, as the president until November of 2013 prior to co-founding uh, Fortinet. So this is where it gets very interesting, where you start to look at some of the background of some of the players here uh, in companies, especially when it looks at leadership. He was... Before that, he was founder, president, and chief executive of NetScreen Technologies, a provider in Net's network security products. Hmm, interesting. Which was acquired by Juniper uh, in 2004. Additionally, uh, it says that Mr. G was executive uh, officer of CIS Inc. and is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. So clearly, like the man's been pretty much well embedded <laughs> within security systems and everything else throughout the course and period in time of his industry. And if you look at it, think about it. He was the founder and president of, of a company called NetScreen, which later got acquired by Juniper, which also was a publicly traded company back in 2004. 
So interesting. You're starting to see how those things come forth. He has 25 years of technical and management experience in the networking and security industries. So the man knows his stuff, which means that if it ever comes time where like, okay, hey, if you need to talk to somebody who knows the industry, he's definitely going to be one of those individuals that you sit down and listen to. Now, of course, everybody always looks at the CEO. They like, always look at the CTO or the CEO. But in companies, especially within tech, the, the one of the bigger titles, which is just as important as most likely your CEO role is your CTO. Like, I mean, it never ceases to fail. And for those startups out there, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Whenever you hear a pitch, like, especially when like, okay, the business side, we're going to hear about what you have to say. And then on top of that, we're going to say, okay, hey, what makes, you know, what makes your experience valid? What, why should we listen to you? And of course, you know, he can sp spill off his 25 years of experience. Then we move on from there. And then it's like, what will validate everything that you say is essentially your team that follows afterwards. So no, most likely at a tech company, we're going to look at your CTO. And so your CTO is going to be able to talk that same language. But then when, you know, it comes down to the nitty gritty and the weeds, this is where it really gets down to it. So let's see, Mr. G has served as president and chief technology officer since 2013 and as a board member of board of directors uh, since February of 2001. Now, this is interesting, right? Because he didn't serve as CTO until 2013, but he was on the board since 2001, which is crazy because Fortinet was co-founded in, again, 2000. So which means that he didn't join the board until later on. He previously served as vice president of engineering and, uh, and as CTO uh, after co-founding Fortinet in October of 2000. So which makes sense because it's February of 2001 and then, of course, October of 2000. Prior to co-founding Fortinet, he held positions as vice president uh, for ServeGate Technologies, a network security provider that was acquired by Amerium uh, Technologies in 2006. So he has some acquisitions underneath his belt, so he understands that process of how it works. Software, direct, uh, software director and architect for NetScreen. Interesting, 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 because there was NetScreen Technologies. So you can see, like, okay, hey, he's always been in the mix. Uh, and software, uh, senior software engineer for uh, Milky Way Networks Corporation, a network security solutions provider. So, and again, he has a background in engineering uh, in which that, like, again, he's done pretty well. And so I'm probably guessing that they kind of like interlapped and pretty much uh, stood by each other until one of them went to Stanford. Uh, so I guess that's where it really like kind of like diverges off. Mark, let me ask you this. Do you pay attention what? to, do you, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So do you pay attention to, so um, because they both had some um, major capacity with NetScreen, do you pay attention to like the longevity of relationship between those um, top C-suite executives? Well, yeah. I mean, in this particular case, they're brothers. So like in this particular case, it's a very like, it's a very like, you know, unique situation. But yeah, I mean, sometimes you'll see that in some cases, you'll see that founders that did very, very well with each other will kind of like say, we're getting the band back together. But you have to understand like the chances of a company becoming successful again after you've had your first ever acquisition, it's tough. Now, of course, you get a little bit of leeway because of the fact that you get more investment and everything else because everybody looks at your track record. But then the other part to that is, is the fact that, okay, you know, there's 25 years there, 25 solid years worth of experience of like literally walking these streets and walking the walk and talking the talk, which is very another thing that's very interesting, which is the fact that they said that he founded. Uh, let's see here. If we go back to here where it says that he founded a, he was a founder of another company, right? NetScreen in 2004. But it's interesting because he founded Fortinet in 2000. Which. <laughs> There's some interesting overlap here where it means that essentially that he founded two companies kind of around the same time or one was like kind of like on the latter part. And essentially the other one was like, OK, hey, it was on its way out the door. And so they were already working on it. And which is the reason why I say it's a very unique case is because of the fact that, again, normally when you get acquired, there is like a lockup period. So in that lockup period, there's like, OK you know, you got the, or what we call the golden handcuffs where you're, where you're pretty much there with the acquiring company for about six months to a year, or even in some cases, two years. But in other cases, especially back in those days, it's like, sometimes it's like they just immediately just acquired and they acquired the team talent and they didn't really need the C-suite and they just kind of like let them go. 
So it's very Wait. interesting as it pertains to their case. Go ahead. Okay, so another question then. So remember how um, I think it was last week um, we were talking. Maybe it was two weeks ago. We were talking about um, companies envision and the market being ready for the vision. So mm -hmm. what was happening in 2000? Because um, this company is pretty like you know cutting edge in that cloud space. So what was happening in the year 2000 that may shed some light on to that other layer you just shared? Well, we had a lot of cyber attacks during these times. And then, of course, mm -hmm. during the doc, like the fall of dot com, there was a lot of dot com companies around the 1999, 2000 era that kind of like went kaput. And essentially, it's like we started focusing a lot on security infrastructure. Now, this is like back in the days when everybody was still using antivirus software and everything else. Like McAfee was still a thing. So was Norton. It was still a thing. Um, and people were paying like 60 bucks a year for antivirus <laughs> software. So again, we were still very much in the infancy stage. So which meant that it was still, well, not in the infancy, but like really still in those golden years where even if you got acquired, it was okay because of the fact that there was other opportunities that were right around the corner. So we were just kind of like scratching. We were just starting to have like brief conversations about the cloud infrastructure, but we were still like, okay, hey, you still had people using, you still had companies using intranet, which means that they're internal intranet, internet, um, which... You know, again, 2000. Oh gosh, I'm I'm dating myself here as it pertains to like my my time in the industry. Um, but again, it's you know I think that honestly here we're, we're looking at it. It was it was a golden hour where it's like you start one and then it's like you know so many like founders were like okay get up and start up another one. Now of course these are the founders, which is very easy to look at these guys and be like all right they've done some pretty awesome things, but then they got some other folks. So let's just take a we're going to just take a shot in the dark here. Gene Hu. So Gene has served as uh, a member of our board of directors since 2019. <clears throat> so which means that they're very new. So they're very much so new to the stage since August of 2016, uh, has served as executive vice president and chief financial officer at Marvell Technology uh, Group Limited, a semiconductor company. Prior to Marvel or Marvell, uh, served as senior vice president and chief financial officer of QLogic. So as you can see, they're more so from a structural piece. Everything about them says finance. But it's very interesting because though that they've been within the tech space, a lot of their experience here really holds within the sectors of you know semiconductors, which is very interesting if you look at what Fortinet is into because of one of the solutions that they provide definitely goes hand in hand with uh, cybersecurity as well as it as it pertains to chips, especially when you're looking at it from a software standpoint in which that they they create their own that's proprietary. So and then on top of that, building that technology and embedding it into enterprise based chips. So having that CFO background of being able to like kind of like I wouldn't say finesse the numbers, but making the financials look beautiful and really looking at it as it pertains to the roadmap for the for, for the future and giving that advisory insight. That's huge. Now, here's the thing. Everybody thinks that when you have a, a, a board of directors that these folks meet every day. Absolutely not. They do not. They meet either once a month or maybe even twice a month. And, you know, it doesn't mean that they're not involved. But again, it's like they serve in limited capacities because nine times out of 10, a lot of people that sit on boards serve on multiple different boards at different companies. Which is very interesting because, like, for example, look at Bob Iger is a great story as it pertains to sitting on multiple boards. Did you all know that he actually was not only the chairman of Disney, but he also sat on the board of directors for Apple? Go figure. Until Apple got into the streaming business. And then Bob Iger was like, hit him with the Drewski. I got to I got to recuse myself. <laughs> All right. So that's Gene who. And so looking at these things and if we you know, go through and look at let's look at an independent director, because those are always interesting, um, has served as a member of the board of directors since 2013 and has served our leader uh, lead independent director since 2018. So pretty much. Let's see here. Uh, founder and chief executive officer of Word Justice Project, an organization devoted to promoting the rule of law throughout the world. He is a retired uh, partner in the Seattle office of KNL Gates. I know that firm very, very well because they actually Good. were a firm that represented us um, back in my start of the, early start of, the, start of days. 
Uh, yes, this Gates is Bill Gates Sr. Senior's firm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then let's see. So pretty much he represents on the, I would probably say that he represents on the general counsel side, uh, given in the sense of a lot of his legal background. So just being able to dissect it through, I mean, he represents legal. So which would make sense the reason why he's the independent, lead independent director. Um, and so looking at these things, it's like, it makes sense why you see Fortinet move exactly the way that they move because of the fact that, again, a lot of the players there represent specific spaces like that definitely support the business. So they bring a lot of that industry based knowledge and some of the, some of those fresh ideas in which that they can like literally say, OK, hey, this is what we're thinking. This is how we would like to move. And whenever they're looking at either a new solution or new products, uh, it makes sense because now you have a well-rounded board of folks that will be objective one but at the same token be able to understand exactly what you're thinking as it pertains to pathway and how to get there so that i would say is a very well-rounded board shall we go to the next one yes That's all right so in the spirit the of i was gonna say in the spirit of today's events given that they reported earnings let's go ahead and talk about our friends over there at netflix now let's talk about netflix <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, outside of like their quarter, it was a pretty decent quarter. I mean, just to just to keep it simple, um, you know, pretty much they came in light as it pertains to their I think their their guidance. Um, that was the that was the major miss. Uh, they gained user subscriptions, uh, especially when we're looking at that new model for that new subscription model, which is including ads. They're still cracking down on folks that do password sharing and everything else. I think, and I mentioned this on Twitter Spaces. I think that what will make them even more successful if they come up with some type of mid-tier model that ultimately that supports it. So that's pretty interesting as well. But I mean, this is pretty much their leadership. Uh, I mean, of what they what they're presenting to us. All right. So we got Chief Legal Officer. We got. Uh, Chief Marketing Officer, we got Vice President of Inclusion and Strategy. Of course, we have Greg Peters as the co-CEO. Uh, you know, pretty much, you know, he formerly worked as Independent Development Officer, responsible for global partnerships with uh, consumer electronic companies, so like TVs and everything else. Uh, getting Netflix, probably that Netflix button on a lot of televisions or remotes. Um, let's see here. The other co-CEO is Ted Sarandos. Um, and what is he responsible for all content operations and led the company's transition into original content production that began in 2013. So probably around that orange is the new black house. Of, yep. Orange is the new black house of cards, arrested development, all those types of things, uh, and leads teams in responsible for acquisition of content. So pretty much when you think about acquisition of content and things and films surrounding, like I said, stranger things, squid game. This is the guy in whom which that like literally has the eye for that. So pretty well rounded. You have one guy in whom which is the, on the partnership side. And sorry if you guys hear the noise in the background, but uh, you have a guy that's focused on partnerships, and then you have another guy in whom which that is focused on essentially the content side, which is the main driver of Netflix's success. All right. So then, of course, we know these guys because of course they're co CEO. So you probably have heard about them. Um, so when we look at a company like a Netflix, right? So we have to look at it and say, okay, hey, what would be major here? Well, of course, the number one thing that they put up here is chief content officer, which I'm glad that they did, right? Because <laughs> there is no Netflix without content. And so Bella is definitely the, the head of that. So pretty much was named head of global TV in 2020, overseeing, overseeing English uh, language and local language scripted and unscripted series. Uh, let's see here. Uh, previously, she she oversaw a local language uh, originals, original series across Europe, Middle East, Turkey. So pretty much for finding and scouring original content and then essentially choosing and figuring out like, OK, hey, well, which ones are the ones that, you know, pretty much would represent best for the Netflix brand? Um, and so I think that this is really where her where, where really where Netflix really shines. Now, of course, you don't really hear about her a lot, but the one thing I would probably say is some of the most active, like, for example, folks that are on the leadership teams at companies and notice we're not looking at the board of directors yet. We're just looking at the leadership, the people who actually work there every day. Um, and these are the folks in whom which that like literally lead. Now, one of the things that you're noticing about Netflix, which kind of makes them very interesting, is they pride themselves on, you know, really having a diverse uh, leadership. So again, it's like 
you know, looking across the board, you know, what do we notice here? <laughs> we see some black and POCs. Question mark. Yes. Who, who would be responsible for their um, lives? Who would be? <laughs> wow. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> and I almost bit into that. Um, that would probably be their chief technology officer. Uh, if I'm if, if we're keeping in a buck, though. It Let's would definitely pull that be up. Deborah Black's uh, Deborah Black, the vice president of engineering. So it would be it would fall the buck would stop here under her watch. You see her? Okay, uh, she must be muted. All right, so yes. pretty much. Yes. So prior to serving at Netflix, she served as vice president of e-commerce services Amazon. So interesting. You know, there's a lot of cross pollen. You'll also notice within certain places or within certain industries or certain parts of industry, you start to notice a lot of cross pollination or a lot of like, you know, moving from this to this. So for example, I wouldn't be surprised if people went from Amazon to a Netflix or a Google to, or a Netflix to a Google or back and forth or Apple and so on and so on. Um, but as you can see where she was responsible for the software that enables Amazon's global business, uh, former corporate vice president at Microsoft, where she led and or where she held a variety of positions within the Windows division. She began her career at Bell Northern Research. So, again, you know, look at the companies here that we highlight: Amazon, Microsoft, and then now at Netflix. So interesting. Um, and then, of course, you know, as we could see, they pride themselves very heavily on their diversity. I mean that's that's one of their that's one of their tools. Now, now this is just their leadership on their day to day. Now let's come over here to their board of directors. Now, of course, you know we already know who the board of directors chairman is and founder, which is Reed Hastings, who co-founded uh, Netflix back in 1997. And did you know that they're pretty much getting ready to do their last delivery of red DVDs, and then they're going to discontinue that service? It's still Mark. running. Yes. I didn't know that. But when I saw the article um, this morning, I was like, they still do that? I I mm. thought that was already done and dusted. Well, it makes sense because there are in areas in which that, you know, streaming service or streaming platforms aren't as well supported because the Internet that's out in those areas isn't as well supported. So you have to think about it. There are still places within the United States where in access to, to strong Internet access or service uh, still needs work even here in the United States, a developed country. So, which is very interesting, but I mean, here you go. So again, you know, pretty much we, we already know the story of Reed Hastings. So let's look somewhere else, shall we? So let's look at Richard Barton, who as chief executive officer of Zillow. Uh, so Rich leads the company's work to transform how people buy, sell, rent, and afford homes. So we already know that he was one of the co-founders there. Um, and then essentially, uh, before Zilla, he he also founded Expedia. So this man has been, <laughs> look, if success <laughs> was a repeat in a person, it would probably be Richard Martin going awesome. from, <laughs> from co-founding Zillow in 2010 and then serving just only five years. And then he became the company's executive chairman. And then, of course, he returned in 2019. But then he was also... The found he also founded Expedia within Microsoft in 1994. So he was working he at was, Microsoft while he founded Expedia. And Expedia is Seattle based, right? Yes, it is. I mean, actually, all three of these here? companies that were all three of these companies that we're talking about were founded right here in Seattle, Washington, or Redmond, Washington for Microsoft. But you know, if you're trying to claim Seattle, we'll let it. We'll let it slide. Yeah, we'll let it slide. You know. <laughs> So, and then on top of that, he was a venture partner at Benchmark. So it's not it's not outside of the realm of possibilities when you've gone through acquisition or when you've gone through acquisitions, you go into the venture capital space. Um, and as you can see, he served on many uh, public company boards and continues to be a director of Curate Retail, Artsy, Zillow Group. Uh, and think about it. He earned a Bachelor of Science in General Engineering and Industrial Economics from Stanford University. So... You'll start to see that Stanford tends to roll around quite well when you see like, you know, folks that join boards. It's like and keep in mind, he also co-founded and served as non-executive chairman of Glassdoor from 2007 to 2018. I mean, he is really out here. working. He is out here 
So, I mean, when you think about like, okay, hey, does Netflix have solid leadership that they've surrounded themselves around? Hmm. You know, <laughs> let's let's go check out Anne. Uh, so she's served on their board of directors since 2015. But before that, she was also holding senior roles at Walt Disney Company and uh, 21st Century Fox and Viacom until she stepped down in January where she oversaw Disney's cable broadcast and satellite properties around the world since 2004, which is crazy. And then, you know, she moved on from different streaming plat or a different media platform, which makes sense. Hence the reason why, you know, now you sit on the board of directors for an, a company like a Netflix, which is significantly, you know, competing against those same types of companies. And then let's look at Strive. Uh, Strive is chairman and founder of Econet Group a telecommunications and technology group with operations and investments in 29 countries, mostly in Africa and Europe. Uh, so it tells us what he does there. Um, and then on top of that, let's see here. Uh, he is chairman emeritus of Alliance. So he's probably like one of those individuals where it's like you bring on board members that represent like either the cultural aspect of it or more so like you bring in nonprofit folks that are like, you know, they've served on multiple boards. So they understand how boards should operate and they understand the flow of boards. And sometimes they could be a solid vote or not only just that, but they just give you a lot of insight as it pertains to like what's happening around the world and can give you perspective when sitting in those board of director meetings. So, you know, every board seat has a purpose as you can, as you can all see. Let's look at another one. Um, that one's, what is that German? So let's, or, or, or Netherlands. So Let's look at Ann Mather. All right, so served on uh, board of directors since 2010. So this is like, you know, right after they went to streaming, um, but also has been a member of the board of directors of Bumble, uh, as well as Alphabet, and serves as chair of its audit committee and Blend Labs, a cloud-based software platform company. All right, so again, you guys are starting to see how this kind of like, you know, was previously director of Glue Mobile, Shutterfly, Airbnb, Zappos, Ariat, Arista Networks, MGM Holdings. I mean, <laughs> that's a lot. That's a lot. I mean, so it Impressive. lets you know, like, you know, and then on top of that, it's like she served as executive vice president, chief financial officer at Pixar. <laughs> so they choose quite wisely. And so when you think about, again, the success of not only their leadership, of what they put forth, but also the board of directors that they also, you know, report to or also supports them. It makes sense why a Netflix exists the way it does today. Shall we move on to our next company? Yes, we should. Um, do you want to do? Um, do you want to do Nvidia? Yeah, let's do, do Nvidia. Do okay. All right. So here's NVIDIA's board of directors. I mean, of course, we could look at their management team. You know, of course, you know, there's two founders. There was Jensen and then there was Chris. And then, of course, they have their company officers, uh, which, you know, you probably hear Colette on their um, you hear Colette on their earnings call uh, quite a quite a bit, as well as uh, Jay Puri, as well as Tim Teeter. You don't really hear about Deborah that as much. Um, but again, you know, everybody knows, you know, nvidia for jensen you know and then of course you know chris you know no slouch either you know there since day one um but has more than 40 years worth of experience so prior to nvidia held engineering and technical leadership at hp and sun microsystems and it's kind of funny because like there's a like a lot of the folks that you see that are within the semiconductor space especially the folks that have over 20 years of experience you could probably draw them back to some form of or some type of genesis, whether it's HP or Sun Microsystems, which is you know quite the interesting feat within itself, but you know, very interesting. Now, of course, when we get to the board of directors, um it could do a little bit better, but again, let's give it, you know, a little bit of so let's think about it. You have quite a few folks here that are very much so academics. Now, within the chip space, why do you think that they would have a lot of academics or quite a few academics that serve on their board of directors? So the reason I don't know, why maybe it's experience. Experience, but also a lot of the stuff that take that transpires within NVIDIA's space or within the semiconductor space is research. 
-hmm. And so having access to groundbreaking research. So think about it. You have California Institute of Technology. Then on top of that, you have Stanford. And then I think there was somebody else, but I, I mean, I may have lost them. But either way. So again, it's like these are folks in whom much that have spent their lives within the industry. Now, let's go ahead and look at like, of course, now you also have some some of the early investors, which is the managing partner at Square Waves, Mechanic Capital Management, uh, New Enterprise Associates, and then of course, Cooley, uh, which is another well-respected uh, law firm. Um, so let's look at some of the, and it's interesting though, because they have a lot of independent consultants that sit on their board as well, but I'll, it's a mixture of research, venture group capital, and then of course, independent consultant. So what do I drive from that? Nine times out of 10, the reason why this board is constructed the way that it is, um, is because of the fact that we already got the research part of the way. Like you always thinking about what's the next thing. But the reason why you have venture capital that's still associated to a board is because of the fact that venture capital, the way that we're structured is always about go, 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 keep going, keep scaling, keep hitting a place of growth. So it's that consistent challenge. So like, for example, if I pull up like Mr. One Harvey uh, Jones at uh, Square Wave Venture has been the managing partner of Square Wave, Venture, uh, Wave Ventures, a private firm since 2004. Uh, has been an entrepreneur as pretty much for an venture investor for over 30 years. In 1981, he co-founded Daisy Systems Corp., a computer-aided engineering company, ultimately serving as a president and chief executive officer until 1987. So this guy goes all the way back to the 80s. Whew. 1997, he co-founded uh, Tensilic, uh, I'm sorry, a privately held technology IP company that developed licensed, high-performance, embedded processing cores. <laughs> kind of like falls in. Uh, and then, of course, uh, he was director of Tentry. I'm seeing a lot of T's here. It's interesting. A company that built data storage solutions for virtual and cloud environments from 2014 until 2018. Notice every single one of these parts that plays into what he did within his career. Look at where NVIDIA has taken some of these exact same things and like literally has like brought it into a whole different stratosphere. And we could probably say the same thing for like, so let's look at, let's say, Mr. John uh, DeBerry. All right. So Centennial Professor of Aeronautics and Mechanical Engineering. Um, so let's see here. From 2005 to 2015, he was Professor of Aeronautics, um, Chair of Faculty, Dean of Students. Uh, DeBerry is a fellow of the American Physical Society, where he also is elected to the chairline of the Division of Fluid Dynamics. He serves on the President Biden's Council of Advisors. Hmm, interesting, PCAS, and Energy Secretary, uh, Energy Advisory Board, so SEEB. Uh, he also serves on the Board of Trustees of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. So, I mean, he's pretty much going to be a career uh, board member. But again, um, I think it's more so in the sense of like probably looking at the connections in which that he brings together. And of course, let's be honest, a little bit of diversity to NVIDIA. All right. So... Let's look at an independent consultant, shall we? Let's look at uh, R.T. Shah. Serves on boards of various companies and nonprofit organizations. So again, another career board member. Um, worked at Eli Lilly uh, and company for 27 years and served in several functional and business uh, leadership roles. Most recently has served as vice president, chief information and digital officer, as well as senior statistician, research scientist. Wow, that's a title. That is a title and a tongue twister. Vice President for Biometrics and Global Brand Development, uh, leader in Lily's Biomedicines business. Now, it's interesting because remember what I was saying about disruptive, about uh, NVIDIA? I think I said this last week or the week before that. I think it was last week. They're kind of like blur, blur yeah. together. Yeah. Where one of the things that they're, which is a huge initiative for them, is health. <laughs> well. Well, well. And she joined NVIDIA's board in 2020. <laughs> wow. Interesting. So again, it's like, I'm probably sure that each one of the members of their board of directors serves a specific core practice. Of course, I could go on, you know, Mr. Wong's you know, page and he tends to keep it pretty short and pretty light. Um, but here's the interesting thing that a lot of folks don't know. He held a variety of positions from 1985 to 1993 or 1993 at LSI Logic Corp. So LLC 
and he all a computer chip manufacturer and from 1984 to 1985 so he served one year at one amd so he used to work at advanced micro devices <laughs> well there you have it i mean that's interesting right there <laughs> indeed indeed all right so let's let's move on outside of the tech sector because uh, you know we could really go on into tech for all like and see it all now let's look at you know one company by the name of JP Morgan Chase and Company, aka also known as the firm. Now, of course, everybody knows who Jamie Dimon is, but let's look at some of the yes. other players that sit on the board of directors. Now, here's the one thing that I'm noticing. Let's count it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then one, two, three, four, five. So that's actually not bad. And then, of course, you have two sisters that are also sitting on the board of directors. So, you know, you know, me and my little personal bias, we're going to go ahead and uh, hit up Miss uh, Alicia Davis um, and learn a little bit about her, shall we? So pretty much has been the CEO of Alto Pharmacy uh, LLC since 2022. Prior to joining Alto, she served in leadership roles at Amazon. All right, count them, uh, including, you know, global customer fulfillment in 2021. So she's very much so recent. Um, and then, of course, uh, from so from 20 to 2022, prior to her role, she spent nearly 25 years at General Motors, where she became executive vice president of global manufacturing and labor relations. So she served as director of General Mills from 2016 to 2019. And, you know, of course, holds some pretty illustrious degrees from some pretty cool uh, uh, institutions. So, again, she brings in a, a lot of diverse experience, whether it's from you know, customer fulfillment to manufacturing, as well as uh, other arenas, uh, such as, you know, pretty much director of General Mills Company. So she's new she's, this year, Mark. She is. She's very new. And that's the reason why I, that's the reason why I stopped on her first. And then let's go to one Miss Melody Hobson. Uh, so pretty much, you know, has been co-CEO of Aerial Investments, an investment management firm since 2019, board of, uh, president and director of since 2000. She also serves as chairman of the board of trustees of Aerial Investments. She also served at Starbucks Corporation. Hmm, there's a lot of Seattle-based companies here. But then also Estee Lauder, um, as well as DreamWorks Animation. So, I mean, that's a pretty nice lineup of companies in which she served on and then of course she does a lot of stuff as it pertains to sitting on boards for nonprofits, like say for example chicago public education fund um and you know she does a lot of work there in chicago i mean i mean <laughs> but yeah so another amazing individual all right so let's look at let, let's let's pull up some of the wall street folks shall we so lead independent director. So again, lead independent director since 2004 and director of Bank One Corporation from 2003 to 2004. So pretty much he was chairman of NBC Universal. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, pretty much from 2011 until his retirement in 2020, he was chief executive officer and president of NBC Universal. So that's where he made a lot of his bones. And then, of course, Comcast. Um, before joining Comcast, he served at Walt Disney Company, ABC Broadcasting. So it's very interesting, given his, given his media background, um, but it's very also interesting as it pertains to like, okay, hey, you know, <laughs> have you ever heard of anything bad about J.P. Morgan? That PR. <laughs> so, Butter, go lay down. Okay, you, he wants to lay underneath the desk. All right, so, and then of course they have their operating committee, but I mean, you know, the folks in whom which that JP Morgan or that Jamie Dimon puts underneath his crown. And, you know, for those in whom which that don't know Jamie Dimon outside of JP Morgan, you know, let's let's roll it off. He became CEO in 2006, uh, but before then he was bank one and served as chairman. Uh, so, and CEO in 2000. So interesting part, right? Because upon the company's, so he was named president and chief operating officer upon the company's merger with Bank One uh, back in July of 2004. So pretty much when I went off to college, he was at Bank One. Uh, and then began his career at American Express. Next served as chief financial officer and then financial uh, commercial credit. 
Primerica Travelers Corporation, which is also still an S&P 500 company, though that nobody really talks about them. And then, of course, moving on concurrently to like Smith and Barney and a few other folks in his early heydays, like you know, Smith, Barney and Salomon and Brothers. And then, of course, Citigroup. So the man has been like well respected, well moved across the entire financial space. And that's the reason why they put some respect on this man's name. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Should I? I? I could go on, but I, I would probably say that, you know, everybody pretty much reads kind of like the same thing at JP Morgan. Now, of course, these are all successful companies, right? Let's yeah. look at a company that's been <laughs> kind Absolutely. of like a, a little dormant, so to speak. <laughs> Under performing the S&P 500 in the worst way. Yeah, so let's look at Match Group. Now, again, these are just, you know, my opinion and my opinion alone, and I do not consent to that. All right, so <laughs> let's look at Match Group. All right, so let's look at, say, for example, their chairman. Uh, and so pretty much, as you can see, been there at Match Group since uh, their chairman has been there since 2015 and has served as chairman of the board of Match Group since 2000. Uh, 2021. So they're fairly new. And here's something about Match Group. I think they've gone through, you know, chairmen's or they've gone through CEOs. You know, there was a lot that was going on. But I mean, pretty much he comes from the Yahoo group, um, which, you know, you know, that's that's something to say there from June 17 to 2021. Um, so he was there when the wheels fell off. Uh, executive vice president of, of IAC. And then, of course, uh, served as chief executive officer of retailing division of IAC. So he's did a lot of work at I uh, IAC. Um, and then, of course, you know, honestly, Ticketmaster. You know, this doesn't really spell. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this doesn't really spell success. Like this says, like career based CEO. And there's nothing wrong with career CEOs where it's like they're appointed. To like, you know, once the founders move out, then essentially it's like, okay, hey, you put somebody there. Like, for example, when Larry Page and Sergey Brin at Google, you know, didn't really want to like really operate as CEO anymore. They brought in Eric Schmidt, who did a phenomenal job. You know, the jury's still out, so I'm going to give him definitely the, you know, the benefit of the doubt to a certain degree. But I mean, come on, you've been on the board of directors since 2015 and honestly what is it that we've learned about match group i'm sorry time is up okay it's up but mark <laughs> are you also noticing i mean you get a little grace period right but yep. 2015 we're, we're this is 2023 now come on now now mark also <laughs> let the record reflect a big difference besides this really basic website compared to some of the yes. mini companies we've looked at where yep. are the pictures we don't see the faces we do They're not hiding. There are no pictures. They don't want us to know. <laughs> right. So, and it's like, it, it kind of gets very interesting, like frontier strategy group. Like, you know, does anybody know who that company was? You know, and then nope. of course, Bernard Kim, 20 years of leadership in the mobile entertainment and gaming uh, industries. All right. So you're at Zynga. Nobody talks about Zynga anymore. Um, but it did do pretty well. But I think that honestly, they just went public because of the fact that everybody was going public. And a lot of his is built from Zynga. But then also he spent 10 years at uh, Electronic Arts um, as a company senior vice president of mobile publishing. But look at what happened to Electronic Arts today. Look, like name a mobile game that came out of Electronic Arts that was something that was noteworthy. All right, so and I'm being, I'm being critical, and I'm not being like a like a, a I'm trying not to be a name snob, but it's like when you look at the companies in which that they come from that they served upon, it's like you got to look at okay, hey, look at it from the time frame that they were at the company to the moment that they exit. Was there any significant successes that came out of that that, that came out of that process? If not, then it's like okay. A part of that, a part of the company's doings or a part of the company's like success or its failure, you share a part of that blame. You share a part of that responsibility. And so it follows you alongside like with the rest of everything else. So and everybody notice is just director. And again, you know, we're not hearing anything like, for example, has served on boards of directors of Angie. Well, I mean, 
another one of those companies like Zynga. And then, of course, we have Vimeo, which, I mean, honestly, Vimeo hasn't really been relevant since the day that YouTube, like, came through and just, like, away with you. Well. I mean, it, it's, it's a sad thing, but it's, like, you know, it you kind of can tell that it's like a little bit underperforming. Like it's under, it's like an underwhelming, like, let's look at, you know, Pamela, like, you know, I guess I can't really say anything here because this is more so legal. So I'm going to leave you alone. Um, let's look at Alan Spoon. All right. Partner Emeritus. So you were awarded that. Um, managing general partner of Polaris Partners. From 2000 to 2010, Polaris Partners is a private investment group. Are they still in existence? We don't know. Um, served as chief operating officer and director of the Washington Post Company, known as now known as Graham Holdings Company. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Washington Post was bought by one Jeff Bezos, and they were they were struggling um, for quite some time. Um, as we started noticing that they were kind of like. <laughs> You know, they they struggled. Let's just say that they struggled along with the rest of print media. So it kind of like fell all underneath the same thing. Um, has served on uh, as member of boards of IAC since February of 2003, uh, Cable One since 2015, and is chairman of the board of directors of Fortive Corporation since July of 2016. Who are these companies? I don't know, but this is. Man, it's kind of depressing. Like it's not, it's not snazzy, it's not fun. Um, compared to you know the bright and vibrant leadership of you know Netflix or some of the so, other companies that looked at today. So yeah, I mean it. It just it just says like you know, and for all we know, like okay, let's 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 try to give Match Group a, a fair shake, shall we? Okay, this is Match. You know, these are all the things that are within their within their portfolio. But how are they doing these days? And especially given in the sense that we're noticing like the, like everybody's reading the same data. Right. You know, for example, you know, people not really going to places where they would normally meet. Of course, it's like, you know, you know, Tinder had its thing. And now it's like people are kind of like over Tinder, OkCupid and the rest of the other platforms out there. You know, I think Bumble came in and just like literally stole that whole entire thunder. You know, so again, you know. What, what you know who are they <laughs> well they are credited with um the swipe, swipe yeah they are they, they they are definitely accredited to the to the swipe generation you know but but they about to swipe <laughs> themselves off the <laughs> off the S&P I mean, in a minute you, you know it's it, it's it's just very frustrating so then you know to to pick up our spirits a little bit <laughs> Yes. Let's, 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 let's go company. to the company in which that honestly, like everybody gets excited about, like at times, especially here are the people that you're probably going to see during um, during WWDC. You're definitely going to see Craig. You're definitely going to see Tim. You know, they're very visible people. You're definitely going to see Eddie. You may see Catherine, but no, you won't see Catherine because she's general counsel. Um, but you'll probably see John. You know, people miss. Uh, Ives, you, you might see Phil Schiller if they talk about music or if there's an innovation. He may even do the unveiling of the Apple, uh, you know, vision goggles or mixed reality headset. Um, so you're going to definitely see some of these folks that will definitely be presenting, including Deidre O'Brien, if they talk about anything on the Apple Store or if they want to talk about App Store or Apple Store India or App Stores. Um, she may make a, a presentation. But again, it's like, OK, you know let's go through them like craig i like honestly if you ever watch a wwdc event or apple event where they unveiled something that talks about mac where that's where he really shines very much so bright but now i think that he's moved across you know multiple parts of the platform and notice how i know these things because of the fact that he's very very visible um shout outs to him he did a in a, a video with uh, mkbhd a few years back where he talked about like you know really you know, the focus of Apple and where is it that they're going. And then pretty much he left and then returned to Apple in 2009 and led the Mac OS division and then took responsibility for iOS as well. So this man manages both Mac OS and uh, iOS. And I'm probably sure, probably sure 
he'll also have a hand in iPad OS and also some of the other OSs because they all work together. And you see him like literally if, if you ever listen to him speak and ever do his presentations where he like does the unveiling of the next Mac OS version, they're hilarious. We know who Tim, who Tim Cook was, the, the, the kid that everybody counted out, but didn't really understand that he was the magic behind Steve Jobs. Um, and, I mean, he allowed Steve, like he was the reason why Steve Jobs was out, was able to go out there and be Steve Jobs. And it was purely because of the fact that, again, he was literally working the business model and everything else that was built in. A guy who served as once upon a time CFO and now leads the stage. Like with a lot of these individuals, you can, it literally reads as a story. Like, you know, senior vice president for John, president of Mac uh, of or pretty much of hardware. So he manages like the hardware, the stuff that goes in, the, the good stuff that goes inside iPhone, iPad, Mac, AirPods, uh, joined Apple's product design team in 2001, where he got to learn under Mr. Ives, uh, Johnny Ives, and then essentially took it to the next step. Kind of looks like his you know, nephew or his son a little bit, which is kind of creepy. But again, um, pretty much has taken over the hardware engineering since 2013. Throughout his tenure, he has overseen hardware engineering work on a variety of groundbreaking projects. And we don't need to name them because this is not like a, a pump Mac up. Wait, or Apple how many up. guys are there, Mark? How many? So that's the other part. So in? there's one or so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13. And women, there's one, two, three, four, five. So quite a few of these folks are pretty much like grandfathered in, like the ones that are pretty much closer to the, you know, to the top. Um, they're pretty much grandfathered in to the to the board of directors. I could probably see that Apple does somewhat of a shifting of its uh board of directors or adding members to the board of directors in the next five years, or within the next five years, you'll probably see that this board also starts to change. But let's let's take a look at like you know since you know Apple does a lot of work in China right you know so what is uh, she represented for? So Isabel provides leadership and coordination across Apple's China-based team. She joined in two thousand eight, uh, wow, pr pretty much during the financial crisis, uh, overseeing the development of cellular, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC, location and, mo and motion technologies. Uh, before joining, uh, she served as vice president of wireless software engineering, Palm. Which, I mean, honestly, there wouldn't be an iPhone if there wasn't Palm before that. So, crazy. Um, let's see. Let's look at uh, Deidre O'Brien. Where does she work before she became a part of the retail side of things? So, 30-year vet. Let's see. Where was she before then? Doesn't really quite speak to it, which is kind of interesting. I think they just more so like to tell the story and the functions of what she does. Her teams oversee a broad range of functions, including talent development, Apple University, recruiting, employee relations. And interesting enough, she's probably one of the key people that's influential for bringing the, the I think, the Apple University to North Carolina, which is, a, I think, to my recollection, it's a billion dollar project in which that they're trying to spur within North Carolina to bring in diversity as it pertains to the next generation of apple uh software engineers or you know engineers or developers or whatever it is into the apple ecosystem so boom there it is so what do we look at right we yeah, see like so let's let's recap it real quick because i know that we've we've reached our cinderella hour um here so what do we learn like because that's the biggest question what is it that we learn from this whole thing Leadership matters. The folks in which they sit at the top matter. Where do they come from? Like, what is it that they've done prior? You know, what are the things that they're doing? You can, and now you can match a face, like get to know the faces so that way you can match faces to essentially the work in which that the company is doing. So now it's like, okay, hey, if, the design, if Mac is trash, <laughs> you now know that you can tweet Craig and be like, hey, Craig, you know, this is trash. Like, you know, this Mac OS version, not liking it, not liking it at all. Let's let's revert. Um, if you're looking at, say, for example, the you know iOS or you know again, Craig. If you're looking at Apple retail stores, or if you're wanting to know like what is the work that Apple is doing in China, you can now match faces to specific causes in which that they do. The companies in which that are doing the right things, it's like you can definitely draw the correlation to what is it that the company does, what is it that they're excelling at, and also what is it that the people that they have at the very tip top on those board of directors meetings, even if they're only meeting twice a month or once a month, 
or every quarter, they're still showing you like, for example, like in order for Apple headset to come out, Apple headset pass through each and every single one of those individuals that we just showed you on their screen. So that's key and influential because any product that literally comes out from any company has to go through the board of directors first. Any product or service that they're going to unveil, and this is not just Apple, this is across the board. Any product or service that comes out of any company will literally have to go through and will be presented by the board of directors and will be led by a vote. And based upon that vote, it's like, okay, hey, it's either greenlit or it's not. So again, when you look at, say, for example, a failed experiment, or when you look at, say, for example, a, you know, why is this company like sitting there stagnant? Look no further than the board of directors, the folks in whom which that green little project. And then on top of that, it's not just the people who do the day to day. It's the people who also like literally have the controlling vote of like really the direction of a company. We could do the same thing for Meta, though that Mark Zuckerberg holds a proxy. He holds the proxy for a lot of those votes. But look at the players that he has sitting on the team as his board of directors. Now, of course, we can go to like energy companies and show you that they bring in activists, le activist leadership and everything else that is making significant changes, especially towards their environmental, social and governance uh, areas. But again, the results are still the same. It's like you want to know what the track record is of the folks who were there. And then on top of that, get an understanding of why they're there. If you literally read through somebody's bio on a board of directors or leadership, and you're still asking yourself, why are they there? Nine times out of 10, either you just need to do a little bit more research on you know, what is it that they actually do and the value that they bring, or it could just be, and if the business is very, if the business or the sector is very simplistic and you're asking like, why is this person there? Nine times out of 10, they're probably just there to either be a yes person for when it's time for when the person that's the head of the board needs votes. There, I said it. <laughs> Well, somebody had to say it, so I'm glad you said it. Yeah. Well, I mean, hopefully that this was influential for folks. And, you know, if it was, go ahead and throw an emoji in the chat um, because of the fact that, you know, again, we wanted to make sure that like a lot of times you, you know the company that you're looking at, but do you know the people behind the veil of the company? Do you know the people who sit in those boardrooms and make the final decision and say so? Uh, that's going to probably have, you know, definition of even the company that you work for or even you know the stock that you're invested into. So getting to know those things and knowing who sits on those boards is very crucial, especially if you're a holder of a stock or even if you're an employee. So hopefully that was valuable to each and every single one of you. Until next time, I'm Mark Monroe. I'm Jill and GC in the place to be coming live from Louisiana. <laughs> and this has been Executive Education. Hopefully, oh, by the way, hopefully you guys spot the clue in the, um, and hopefully I wonder, I don't think that anybody spot the clue in the thumbnail. And then on top of that, I wonder, do you notice anything in, say, for example, this space? If you didn't, I did. <laughs> if you didn't, if you don't know, now you know. But until next time, peace, y'all. Bye.